Yeah, so I, I would say that my musical journey started uh, probably a little bit later than a lot of my uh, peers at university who had probably played an instrument since they were uh, knee high to a piccolo, <laughs> as I like to say. Um, so I began really when I was around 10 or 11 years old. Uh, I think I'd picked up an interest in music before then, um, but it didn't really formally take off until I was around 11, 12, probably at my early teens. Um, but it was really, uh, of all instruments, it was the organ that first really sparked my interest in music. And I have this very, very vivid memory uh, of um, when my uh, parents got the Ankara Cyclo Encyclopedia for, uh, for PC, which came on a disc and uh, you had to put it into, the, it probably sounds quite alien to a lot of youngsters today to, to have to put a floppy disc into a computer to get an encyclopedia. Uh, but that was our Wikipedia back then. Um, and I remember finding this um, this article on J.S. Bach uh, and there was a little video or rather a little audio clip of his uh, famous Toccata and Fugue in D minor. And I remember just being absolutely spellbound by this sound, uh, not only the sound of the organ, which of course is a, a wonderful instrument, um, but the, the counterpoint, uh, the way Bach was combining melodic lines, I, I didn't know any music theory back then. I had no formal training really back then, but I was just really spellbound by the sound of, about how one, in, one musician was able to play all of these simultaneous melodic lines. Uh, so that's one of my earliest memories of really, I guess, falling in love with music and discovering that it kind of uh, brought something out in, in myself. Um, and then continuing with the theme of the organ, my grandmother, uh, she had this old Yamaha electric organ, uh, you know, one of these two manual things with a thousand buttons. It looked more like a cockpit of an aircraft than an instrument. Uh, but she used to play, she was a pianist, she had piano lessons um, uh, obviously many, many years ago, and uh, she had a love for music and I think that had a huge effect on me. Uh, I, I was very happy to sit in her lounge listening to her play um, traditional tunes such as Scotland the Brave and uh, obviously some of the classical melodies as well. But uh, I remember very clearly she had um, quite an extensive collection of classical CDs. I remember very clearly, so clearly, this one white box set. I think it was called The Classic Experience or something like that. Um, and I, again, I, I was just hooked on this and I would, I would listen to this CD over and over again. It was all the, the, the kind of big hits of classical music, the uh, Tchaikovsky's Waltz of the Flowers from Nutcracker, uh, Hall of the Mountain King. But for me, that was one of my earliest um, connections, I suppose, with, with classical music. And uh, I remember very distinctly, this is before I'd ever really started to learn how to play. I remember that uh, I asked my grandmother, can you show me how to play whatever tune it was? It might have been Scotland the Brave, really simple C major tune. And that's how it all began uh, in a nutshell. It started with the organ by hearing organ music by Bach, who remained, who became an extremely important figure uh, in my uh, musical life and, and still is the most important. And, um, and playing these, these simple melodies on the organ. I would say school was incredibly important. Uh, it's, I'm not ashamed to say that school was a difficult time for me, uh, or rather it was a challenging time for me in many respects. Um, I, uh, around the age of nine or 10, I, I moved schools um, due to family circumstances. And, um, and so uh, music became, and I think one of the reasons I really, uh, wanted to explore music was because music became a very a very safe place for me it became something that was very a, a constant in my life uh, and to this day that's true uh, music is, is has always been somewhat of a refuge to me um, as it is for many many people uh, I realize but at school um, when I moved to school uh, music was especially important became especially important for me and I had some fantastic teachers at school who who I think I can really thank for for seeing this uh, uh, enthusiasm and this love for music, uh, albeit kind of unshaped, it, it wasn't it wasn't really bound by any particular formal training as such. I had had a piano teacher um, before this, um, but it was st I still had a long way to go in terms of music theory, music understanding, being able to uh, think about music in a in a critical way. 
but I can really thank one or two teachers, one in particular, for really nurturing that love for music. And I remember uh, we had a class on uh, composition, which uh, looking forward to talking talking more about today. But uh, we we were given an assignment by the teacher to to simply write a piece of music. I think it was quite a free assignment, and the, and the teacher said, "I want you to 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 come up with with something, a melody." Um, I can't remember exactly what the, the criteria were. There will have been something, obviously. But I came up with something that was remarkably uh, like something that Bach might have been written in terms of the kind of, it was very, very early attempts, very un <laughs> kind of uh, unpracticed attempts at counterpoint. And uh, I'd written it for organ. It, that's the sound that I wanted to, to, to have. And I remember this was a really key moment for me because uh, I handed this, manuscript uh, to my music teacher which was no doubt riddled with uh, errors in terms of the notation and so on but I remember being really feeling really encouraged because he, I remember he was quite impressed by this uh, this, this early attempt at, at putting notes on paper and I remember I was very proud because he showed it to the rest of the class and this was a and asked me to play it as well and that, that was a really important moment for me uh, so I suppose for me, school was, it was the place where I really found my, I really found that music was what I wanted to do. Uh, I realized that very early on, I think, from, from sort of GCSE level. Mm. Yeah, it, it's a good question, this, this business about the two instruments, so the similarities they have and the differences they have, because um, I, I went, after I moved to school, I began taking lessons in organ and, um, that was the first time I started using the pedals as well and learning about registrations using the stops to create different textures and different sounds. Um, but I, I, I can't remember exactly when it happened, but there was, there was a turning point where I think um, the piano, for want of a better expression, it spoke to me more. I, I found myself playing the piano more often than, than the organ. Uh, and I kept the two instruments side by side for some time. Um, but I'm, one of my kind of clearest memories from, from that time, uh, GCSE music, uh, was spending my lunch breaks playing the piano in the music room. And I had a very, an incredibly patient teacher who I now realize gave up his lunch breaks so that I could sit and play piano in the music room. Uh, but I think it was something to do with the repertoire. I think uh, organ repertoire still has uh, incredibly, um, uh, it's still very important to me. And I still love the organ music of Bach and the French composers as well. Uh, but the piano really took over and I then developed an interest in, for example, Mozart and Beethoven and Mozart became an especially important figure for me in both in terms of my piano playing and, and in terms of my composing. Um, so I suppose that it, it sort of gradually happened. The organ uh, kind of gave way to the piano. And to this day, I would say that the piano is by far the instrument I'm most proficient on. I still play the organ uh, for occasional church services here in, in Norway. Uh, but I would by no means call myself uh, an organist, uh, a, a proper organist, at least. Um, but um, as far as the composing goes, I think that transition really happened quite a bit later uh, at university, actually. Um, it wasn't until towards the end of university that I decided actually uh, composition is something I'd really like to, to explore. Mm. Yeah, um, first and foremost, my, uh, I think the three or five years in total that I spent at York University were, were not only formative, but also crucial in my uh, musical upbringing and um, my identity and abilities as a performer, uh, for sure. And what's interesting is there was a, there was a kind of a stage in my life, uh, in my musical life that came before performance and ultimately before composition where I was very interested in the academic side uh, of music. And I remember that when I, when I started York University, one of our first projects was music analysis. And for me, this was, this was heaven. I loved, I loved analyzing music. I loved thinking about music in an analytical way. And I spent a good part of my time during uh, my GCSE and A-level years with my head buried in scores, Haydn and Mozart symphonies and, uh, and so on. So for me, this was with this was a real dream to be able to to be able to study music analysis, um, and uh, we had a fantastic a fantastic uh, lecturer in that Tim Hal um, at York Uni, 
and the, the assignment for that for that project was to write uh, uh, an essay. We we were able to choose a piece of repertoire, and we were to write an essay where we analyze that, talk about it in an analy analytical way. And I chose Mozart's 40th Symphony, uh, focusing on the first movement um, and melodic development in the 40th Symphony. So I I, I got so much. Uh, that, I got so much from that process and it was an, ex an extremely rewarding process uh, going into such analytical depth about one composer and one piece that I, I think I decided actually, I, I made the decision that this is, this is really what I'd like to continue doing. I'd love to, uh, to be able to analyze and write about music and think about music in an academic and analytical way. So actually before I decided that I want, wanted to perform more, I was very much, um, of the mindset that I wanted to to write about music, uh, and uh, I did consider musicology uh, actually, funnily enough. Um, but uh, towards the end of my bachelor's degree, um, I realised that writing about music was not what I enjoyed most. It wasn't certainly wasn't my strongest point, and I think that uh, looking back, I've read back actually re very recently over some of my essays from my bachelor's degree. And I realized that my mind was elsewhere, <laughs> even though I really enjoyed the process behind it and exploring, for example, composers and particular periods of music. I think my mind was very much on, I want to be playing music. I, want to, I was much more interested in the hands-on uh, practicing and interpreting and, and performing music. Um, but uh, to, to go back to your question, uh, Matt, uh, about kind of that transition from school to university, when I arrived at university, I was, not f fully formed as a performer. I had had both organ and piano lessons before, but there were many technical flaws in my playing. I had a long, long way to go, a long road ahead of me in terms of developing a, a solid technique. Um, so I, I was fortunate enough to um, uh, have a teacher at university who was uh, extremely patient and who saw, I think, that I had this, this love for composers such as Mozart and Bach. Uh, and my piano teacher, uh, Joan Dixon at uh, York Uni, it was her that really nurtured my love for Bach's music especially, uh, and that I carried right through to the end of my master's degree. Um, but what she did was to able, to, she, she was able to really give me a solid technique. Uh, we worked on, for example, Hannon and Cherney and scales and sight reading and interpretation and performance practice. So that those three years re were, were crucial, uh, I suppose to answer the question, university was crucial for me in, developing my technique uh, and yeah abilities I suppose. Mm -hmm. I think that that side to me as a musician uh, was always there actually. Um, I uh, in anticipation of today's interview actually uh, for fun started looking through some of my old, uh, I have some, many folders and bags full of uh, papers from uh, both school and university and I actually unearthed this uh, pile here, and all of this is sheet upon sheet upon sheet of, of notes, uh, the uh, very early attempts at composition. So I think it was something that I, I'd always been interested in, but um, I would say that really that, 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 that change in mindset from wanting to be primarily a performer to wanting to devote more time to composing, to, as you say, sit down and actually work on writing music. I think that happened quite late. Uh, and I think it actually happened um, certainly well after my uh, master's degree, uh, because when I finished my master's degree, which was, which was a, a degree in performance, it was performance practice, and, um, as mentioned, uh, Bach, uh, Schumann, uh, accompaniment of a German leader was very much uh, focused around that. Uh, and then I had this, what I would call a hiatus, a musical hiatus. I had uh, quite a gap of a, a couple of years where I, I didn't take music quite as seriously. Uh, I still played at home, but life had other ideas. I didn't have the freedom that, I, that I'd had at university to be able to work on performing and composing. Um, but I would say the transition to really w focus on developing as a composer came in very recent years. I would actually say in the last couple of years, um, really since moving to Norway, uh, I would say. That's really interesting. Um, I, I think moving to Norway has been um, a hugely important uh, step for me. Uh, 
aside from the obvious life changes that come with essentially leaving your friends and family and everything that's familiar to you, culture, language, climate, leaving that all behind and basically starting life from scratch, which is what I did in January 2018, so a little under three years ago. Uh, I, I did just that. Uh, it, it was the scariest thing I've ever done. Uh, but also for me, now I look back, if I, if I think strictly professionally and, and, and about music, it was probably the best thing I've ever done. Um, certainly the, the, early, the earlier months and the first year of, of, of being in a brand new cult, um, country and culture were challenging and I'm sure anyone who has done that uh, can can relate um, but what Norway what being in Norway has given me is I guess I guess the courage if, if, if I know it might sound a little bit cliche or cheesy but it really has given me so much more courage as an individual to say you know what I, I'm going to try it I'm going to try and, and uh, learn a new language I'm going to try and uh, adapt to a new culture and more recently uh, turn my hand more to composition and focus more on composition. Um, so I think the, the, the physical move here has, has really been hugely uh, beneficial to me as an individual. Uh, it's given me that courage to be able to say I've never tried this before but I'm going to try now. Um, and um, certainly in Norway, talking about Norway uh, in general, it seems to me after nearly three years, it seems to me that there's a, an extremely healthy uh, respect and um, art is really valued here. I think art, culture, uh, music are really valued here in general. Um, so there's a very healthy respect for the arts. So I was extremely lucky in the sense that I was able to start working a little bit as a substitute teacher at, um, we have something called Kulturskola, which means culture school. Um, so in Norway, there's a system called the Culture School, which basically gives access to younger people, uh, gives them access to music, art or drama, uh, learning in those three subjects. Um, it makes it more accessible, in other words. Uh, it's, it's partly funded by the state, and so it makes um, music education and arts education much more accessible. And I think it's a wonderful thing. Uh, and that's my primary... Um, job uh, these days it's, it's teaching at the culture school um, but I feel as though life in Norway has given me a lot more freedom as an artist as well um, I've been given some fantastic opportunities to aside from teaching to perform and uh, in more recent times uh, composing as well mm. an incredibly complex process to describe because every composer of course has their own way their own creative process their own uh, things that help them get into that creative mindset um, but for me, one of the most important things is actually deciding to do it, is actually taking that step to say, OK, between this hour and this hour, I'm going to sit and either continue with something I've been working on before or start planning or sketching something new. Um, so more often than not, it comes from. And of course, when you are when you are working full time, when you have an, another job, uh, as I do as a teacher, that's really important to find a structured way to uh, to do it. Um, so that for me is, is, is very important, is, is, is structuring my, my day and my week so that I actually have enough time to, to, to devote to it. Um, but on other, on other occasions it can be incredibly unpredictable, incredibly spontaneous. I <laughs> recently, I always make sure I have a manuscript pad in my uh, work, in my work bag with all my music books because it's it really is true. You, you never can know when you're going to get a, a good idea. And it could, be the, it could be the smallest fragment of an idea that, that later develops into something quite substantial, as I'm sure you can relate to with your film. Your... It has, it has, yeah. Uh, and, um, and, and I would, I would say for any, if there are any budding composers uh, watching this, I would say uh, it, it's so important to, uh, to, to take the time to, to, to record something, even if it's as simple as, as you say, Matt, just singing something into your phone, or very often I'll prop the phone just on the, the music stand here and play it and be, you know, in between pupils if there's something that I really want to capture. But there are times when, when it feels hard, it feels like a, a chore. Uh, and I would, I would say actually, the best thing to do, at least for me, is to not force it. If, I, if I'm in that mindset where it feels like, Sort of swimming upstream or really going against the current 
if it feels like I'm forcing it, I step away from it. I do something else, which could actually be nothing to do with music. It could be, I might go and go about some, some daily chores in the house or something. And very often that process, doing something where I can completely switch off my mind, that helps. Um, so that, that's one of the tips I can give uh, to any, any kind of budding composers out there. I would say, um, yes, it's, it's important to plan. Yes, it's important to have a good idea of, of structure and um, what the goal is, what you're, what you're trying to achieve. But at the same time, if you're, if you're sitting there and it's going nowhere, uh, then do something else. For me, that, that is really effective. It's just go for a walk, tidy around the house, and just that process, I think, frees up, frees up my brain, at least, to, 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 to work on these ideas. And as you said, suddenly, uh, an idea can come out of nowhere, and uh, that can, one measure or two measures can turn into a whole movement uh, on occasion. But yeah, definitely ideas have come when I'm just drifting off to sleep, and um, it can be quite annoying sometimes, because it's like, oh, <laughs> got to be up early, but at the same time, I want to make a note of it. Yeah, and I, and I think it's it's no coincidence that many of the greatest orchestrators have also been pianists. Um, if we think of the likes of Beethoven, Tchaikovsky, uh, to name just two, uh, and, ma and many more, obviously. Um, it's, I think have it, being a pianist has, has, uh, has been a huge help. Um, and um, in terms of harmony, understanding how intervals and relationships between chords uh, and melody work and, and, and counterpoint as well. So I would say that the piano is one of my most important tools in the composition process. Um, and one thing that's, again, another, another practical tip that I can give anyone who's interested in writing for more than say one instrument, if, if we're talking about an ensemble or even an orchestra, uh, writing, writing in a short score, or writing a piano score first can save a lot of time. Um, I, I would say that one of my flaws as a composer is wanting too soon to go to, to the score um, because I very often have very clear idea in my head, very clear image, if you like, in my head of how that idea, that melody will be scored and, and divided between the different families of instruments. Or maybe that melody will, I think, will work best on a flute with something underneath. But I think that it's, it's a very sensible thing, a very practical thing to be able to write something first in piano score, in other words in two staves rather than 20 odd. Um, but uh, I never received any formal instruction in or, or training in how to orchestrate. Uh, it's something I really wish I'd had um, and I would say that my the, the orchestral composing that I'm doing now, the orchestration, a lot of it is experimentation and uh, realizing that certain combination of instruments don't necessarily work as well as others. Um, understand, I would say it's so important to understand the capabilities of each instrument um, and the ranges, of course, of each instrument. That's extremely important, uh, being able to write something that is, is playable, uh, first and foremost. I, I remember that I, when I was at university, I think I found a book on orchestration. Um, I forget who, who the author was, but I can, I can visualize it. it was a blue hardback book on orchestration. And within this book was contained a chapter on each on the, on the various families and various instruments. And that was really, really helpful for me, who had never really had so much experience writing for orchestra before or no formal training in orchestration. Just understanding the capabilities, i.e. range of each instrument, um, knowing the lowest and, and highest notes uh, that are capable, that, that was a huge help. I would say. Um, but a lot of it, I would say that my uh, learning in orchestration has come from studying scores. Uh, and as I mentioned, I during, right from my GCSEs, and um, especially in, during A-level and even today, looking at uh, orchestral scores has been hugely important because uh, you then see, you learn from the masters, you learn what combinations of instruments work well together, uh, what kind of textures work well together. Um, so for me, that was hugely important thing. I remember I had shelves, uh, actually uh, books bought from banks, the shops that we worked at together uh, in York. I had shelves of these, these small yellow um, Eulenburg uh, miniature scores, Haydn symphonies, and then later the Dover scores, collections of Mozart symphonies, Beethoven symphonies. Um, so for me, just, just making that connection between what I was hearing and what Beethoven, for example, had done within the score 
was was my education that was my training in orchestration mm. I think uh, I, I never usually fully orchestrate by hand uh, it's just it's just a practical point really I think that uh, sometimes I'll have more than two staves for example if I have a solo instrument for example I'm working on a on a movement now which is uh, a flute solo uh, with harp and string accompaniment with other woodwind instruments uh, as well so for me it helps to have at least three or four staves um, but I, I acknowledge that I can be quite impatient and so that when I feel as though I have enough uh, substance on the piano score on the on the handwritten score I'll then move it straight over to um, the and I, as you mentioned the uh, Sibelius I use Sibelius I think it's very very uh, user-friendly uh, program um, and but, but on other times on other occasions I will will produce more before I move it over to the um, uh, orchestration side on, on, onto the computer uh, because I think it's important to have to be sure about the idea before you then spend time orchestrating it um, and I think when you are when you have limited time and um, when you when you are uh, first setting out to, to, to compose especially in we're talking about an orchestral setting time is precious and I think that you can it's easy and I certainly have uh, used a lot of time orchestrating ideas that I later cast aside uh, so I think it's it's really important to be kind of confident and sure about the idea you've written um, and com maybe come as far as you can writing it in, in short score and piano score first uh, before you then because it is a very time consuming process orchestration experimenting with orchestration and of course then there's the aspects of like dynamics articulation bowing and phrasing uh, there's there's many details to consider so that would that would be my my advice just from experience is do as much as you can first in short score before moving it onto uh, onto the orchestral score but i acknowledge that a weakness of mine is that i'm i'm so excited by an idea and often an idea can actually be centered on the orchestration or it can come out from the orchestration um so then i might actually orchestrate four measures or sometimes as little as two measures so that i can okay I know that that works. I can then proceed from there. Mm. I I would say for me, it's the best feeling in the world. Uh, and going back to your earlier question about why, or rather how I made that transition from being primarily a performer to primarily a composer. Uh, I think it was that, that feeling that really made me realize this is what I want to do. This is what I get most uh, reward from, most personal reward. The first time I ever had that uh, feeling of hearing my music played back to me by real musicians was actually at York Uni. We had a, a project in Counterpoint with Neil Sorrell at York Uni. And I composed a, a fugue for a string quartet. Um, and uh, I remember in one of our classes, in one of our uh, lectures, uh, hearing my fugue played back to me by four real string players, two violins, viola and cello. And it was just, even though it was a really short piece, uh, and it was my one of my early, earlier attempts at, at formal counterpoint, it was just the best feeling in the world. I remember having this, this real sense of, uh, I, I've created something, uh, this is mine, this is my something of mine that I'm hearing. Um, I, I, I was also uh, fortunate enough to hear the same few played on organ uh, by a um, close friend and colleague of mine who um, performed it in a lunchtime concert at, at York. So those two occasions, having the same piece performed to me in two different um, arrangements was, was fantastic. And you mentioned the, the trio as well, trio Triva. Um, they, 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 there's an interesting story that I had actually composed this piece called uh, Skrim for, uh, for piano. And uh, Ida, the clarinetist in the trio, uh, who is a, a friend and colleague of mine at the culture school, she, she asked me if, if it was okay if they arranged it for their trio. And I, I was delighted, of course. Uh, I'd never considered this arrangement as a really unusual arrangement of instruments, saxophone, clarinet and guitar, but incredibly effective um, and very, very interesting text, really speaking. We don't normally put those instruments together. Um, and they made this arrangement of uh, Skim and hearing it back and listening to that performance was wonderful. Uh, and that was really the first time, aside from that early string quartet experience, that was the first time I'd heard a professional uh, group perform my music. So it's a great, a great moment. Mm.
Yeah, uh, so currently uh, very ambitious, very big project. Um, so since December, January of this year, um, I've been working on actually a ballet score. Uh, ballet has always had held a very special place for me. I've been, uh, I've sort of been in love with the music of Tchaikovsky and the Sleeping Beauty since I was, since I was at uh, secondary school. Um, and um, lately I, I was just, around a year ago, I was inspired to, to, to begin work on, on my own ballet score. So for me, uh, that's my, that's my, one of my largest ambitions is for this, uh, or dreams is to have this, this, this work performed. And it's actually a ballet score based on Hans Christian Andersen's uh, Thumbelina, um, which uh, surprisingly hasn't had a, a ballet adaptation uh, before. So very much influenced by, I guess one would call it pastiche composition. It's, it's very much influenced by the classical composers. I hear a lot of uh, Grieg and Tchaikovsky and Mozart and um, very much influenced by the great ballet composers. So it's very exciting, big, big project, but really enjoying it. Mm.